Hello. Um, welcome. I this is my first time running a Facebook Live, so hopefully it all works out great. Um, we are officially live for this vegan fashion and innovation session. So um, as people come in, I'm going to try and moderate a little bit. Um, so I um, I'm just here a bit early, making sure that everything's working out great. Um, and as you come in, I can hopefully see your names and genuinely like, really welcome you to the session. Um, so uh, currently I see I, there's a little I that says I have four people. So if you are one of those four people, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. Um, I uh, am... Basically, this is my, so this is really my first time uh, running a Facebook live session, but hopefully we will have a, a great time. I have been teaching online since the beginning of this year. And so I am very much used to just talking to a screen um, because most of my students do not put their cameras on. So I am used to that. Um, so I'm just going to wait uh, till about 6.30 to 6.33, giving everyone an opportunity to log in. Um, and then I'll be able to read um, a quick acknowledgement of country and then talk to you about what I am most passionate about, which is veganism, fashion and innovation. Um, so hopefully uh, people are still joining us. Um, I uh, am... So I am Rachel Lamarche. I'm so happy that you could join me today. Um, if you can see me, do you want to maybe uh, type me a little comment and say like, all working great, um, you know, anything that like that's polite and nice, but just like just to, to let me know that it's all working out. Looking good from this end. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Welcome. Welcome, Jessa. If you want to say hello, it seems like it's the only way that I can see you and I can see your name. So that if you if you write a little comment, I'll be able to say hello back. So that's cool. Otherwise, I don't know that I have. I'm probably there is probably a function here that allows me to know who's um, who's logged in and who's looking and who's watching. But it seems like it is not. I might not be able to do that myself as I'm not entirely certain how to do it. So if you're here and you know me and you want to say hi, cool. I will welcome you personally. Otherwise, so far I don't know that I can um, that I can see <laughs> who's here. You are like in the universe, looking through your screen at me. Hey, Bess, thank you so much for coming. Bess, who just wrote a comment, is a fellow PhD um, at RMIT, which is where um, I study and do my PhD. So, hi, thank you so much for logging in. You're very sweet. Um, so it is 6.30, as I said, I'm just going to give everyone a few minutes to come in, um, making sure that, um, that we basically have a huge live audience for this session. Um, I do believe that the sessions are recorded. So if there's anything that you like furiously writing and you feel like you want to come back to it and, um, and get some details, you can do that. Otherwise, I'm also very happy to share my email if you have any questions, if anything kind of stays um, or that you would like to, you know, have some of the links that I'm going to talk about because I will be covering a lot of ground this evening. And for the first time, I'm flying blind, meaning that I usually have a PowerPoint presentation. This time I am trying to do it um, with the PowerPoint, but without showing it to you. So basically, it's like you have to take everything that I say for cash. Um, not really. Everything is very well supported. So um, I'm just just going to make sure that I do it. So because I don't want to just be talking and not do it. So um, before we start, I just want to do the acknowledgement of country that is specific to the Moreland City Libraries. And I live uh, in Moreland. Therefore, I'm assuming that it also applies to my place of work and study. So Moreland City Libraries um, acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people as the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways in the area now known as Moreland, and we pay respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, as well as to all First Nations communities who contribute to the life um, of the area. So um, hopefully that was, um, uh, hopefully you see, like, I don't know if you see, if I'm looking at my screen, if you see something else, but 
anyway, so that was beautiful acknowledgement of country, so important. I believe it is NIDOC week as well. So, you know, very, um, yeah, I very appreciative that this was reminded to me that I needed to do this to the, for the session. So, um, welcome, welcome to vegan fashion and innovation. So, um, my, uh, my name is Rachel Lamarsh. I'm hopeful that you join me because you have an interest or uh, a passion in this subject. I definitely do. Um, veganism uh, has been a huge part of my life for a very long time. I just want to quickly give a disclaimer as well that everything that I'm going to say in this session is um, a part of it is obviously very much representative of what I do, what I do in my work, uh, what I do in, in my research somewhat. Um, but at the same time, it's been very important for me to kind of put forward this idea that one, when I make um, claims or discussions about veganism, I am talking about myself. So I do not talk for all vegans um, and I, I do not take any positions that are specific of the council either. So um, all of these views are mine and my own only. I'm sure that there's a lot of vegans that share them. Um, but ultimately, I just wanted to say, I think it's quite important for me to, to specify that I don't talk for all vegans. So um, if there's, hopefully there's no question as of yet. Um, thank you, everyone uh, who are putting little comments. Uh, oh, yes, uh, the, we have a, another mo moderator from Moreland who wanted to remind everyone that there are um, notes that are available. They are not exhaustive notes. I might send her more uh, following this session, but um, I believe that it is um, pinned. So if you look at through the comments, there's a little post that you can see that has uh, the notes to the event in which I think um, some books that I've, well, one book that I've discussed and then other places to get uh, really interesting information that I've sent in advance um, to uh, the lovely person at the library who was kind enough to invite me to do this session. Um, so, so that was my little disclaimer saying that um, ultimately, you know, these views are my own um, and hopefully the knowledge that I bring to you is um, factual and uh, supported and I uh, will be happy to share my sources if there's, you know, any, um, any questions or anything like that. So about me, uh, so I am Rachel Lamarche. I am originally from Montreal, Canada. So I am French Canadian, uh, which explains the accent. I uh, basically did my undergrad in fashion and textiles, uh, merchandise management before working at Stella McCartney um, in New York and Paris, and then uh, basically left it all behind and moved to Australia about eight years ago now. Um, I stopped working in fashion for a little bit because PR was not necessarily everything, my end all and be all. And um, as of a year and a half ago, I decided to come back to study and do my PhD. Um, so my PhD is about, uh, in some way, veganism and fashion, but it's more about veganism and fashion consumption. So in my research, I'm trying to understand how people um, who identify as vegan, um, how their relationship with products um, uh, that are of a fashion and textile, uh, you know, identity, I guess. So like, uh, you know, everything that's clothing or bags or accessories, um, how that rela relationship changes as, um, as people become vegan or adopt a vegan identity. So that's a little bit about me and my research. But on the other side, I'm also a person who is passionate uh, about fashion and textiles, the actual materials. So I also do a little bit of that in the sense where I uh, love to run these kinds of sessions and I have built myself a little library where I have all of these really cool materials um, that are being used to, um, to basically replace traditional animal materials, most specifically leather. So they are the ones that I'm going to be able to show you a little bit later in the session today. Uh, but there is so much incredible innovation happening in so many different areas. So we're gonna talk about those replacements, but innovation in fashion and textiles is widespread. Um, I think that obviously COVID has potentially, you know, halted a little bit the speed at which um, the, the innovation is happening. But ultimately, there is just continuous, the industry is in need of change and the industry is in need of um, trailblazers who will come and kind of create new sustainable innovation uh, to replace 
those animal materials because ultimately most of them are unsustainable for our planet. So uh, that's a little bit of the intro about me and why I'm here. Um, hopefully, usually I ask if it, this is a, like not a live audience over Zoom, I ask people to tell me a little bit about themselves and you know if there's anything specific that they want to learn. So if you are here with a specific burning question, like there's something that you're, I've been wondering about this for such a long time, this is the thing, please pop your question in the comments and I will do my absolute best to uh, respond uh, because maybe that is the reason why you're here. You have this burning question that you desperately um, want answered. So happy for you to do that. So I'm gonna quickly have a look and see if there are any questions so far. It doesn't seem to be any questions so far, so that's all right. Um, cool, fantastic. So um, before I kind of usually start talking about materials, I want to remind everyone um, of a, an important definition that I think that if you're vegan, you probably know. If you're not vegan and you're here just purely by interest, fantastic, welcome. Um, and so this is a little bit for everyone who's here so that we kind of all start on the same foot. So this is the definition of vegan or of veganism as defined by the vegan society. So historically, the vegan society was founded in 1944. It was in, uh, in England, it was an offshoot of the vegetarian society. I was a, a slightly more um, a restrictive faction of vegetarianism, which is, you know, makes a lot of sense if you look at what veganism is today. Um, so the definition, which I will be reading, uh, just to make sure that everyone kind of knows where we're starting from is veganism is a philosophy and way of living which seeks to exclude all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose, and by extension promotes the development and use of animal-free alternative, which we'll speak about today, for the benefit of humans, animals, and the environment. In dietary terms, it obviously um, denotes the practice of dispensing with all products derived wholly or partly from animals. So um, basically, I think that always hearing this definition kind of establishes clearly that veganism in by definition is not only a diet, it is an all encompassing lifestyle. So um, hopefully there's no questions as of yet coming back, checking up quickly if there's any question. Doesn't seem like there is, so I'm going to continue. Um, so first question, if veganism is not just about, um, you know, food and diet, then that means that fashion and textiles, fashion and textile products, some of them are obviously not vegan. So what is not vegan in fashion? So there's a lot of materials that are not vegan in fashion. Uh, the main ones that uh, will kind of come to mind automatically from pretty much any and all vegans that you will speak to are leather. So all types of leathers, obviously wool, silk, and fur. So these are kind of the main materials that um, originally straight off the bat that you can think of that are not necessarily vegan in accordance with the definition. When I took the time at the beginning of the session to specify that I don't speak for all vegans is because there is a lot of intricacies in regards to the way that people engage with the, consum the consumption of products within fashion and textiles. And that's why I'm doing my PhD on it. But in regards to the definition and the specificities, those materials are not vegan. So, uh, there is actually an incredibly exhaustive list, which I will probably ask uh, to be added to the notes of this event. So uh, the most exhaustive list of animal materials, so um, of products that find themselves in fashion and textiles that aren't vegan, was actually made that by the British Retail Consortium. So it came out earlier this year. It came out in, um, I believe, January of 2020, but could have been December 2019. And it's really incredible. So the list has everything from the types of glues um, to the, the types of skin, the types of wools, shells, the dyes, 
uh, the coloring. So it, if you're interested in having like an actual, pretty much the same as if you encounter a vegan person, we usually, especially when you're a, a new to veganism, you kind of walk around with a list of things that tell you, okay, um, not only am I, you know, not looking for milk or eggs, but also there's all of these little intricate ingredients that find themselves in food products. The same happens with fashion. So um, this list that is uh, was developed by the British Retail Consortium is very exhaustive. Um, and it is personally my favorite list out there uh, because it is so all-encompassing. Um, so if that's something that's of interest to you, that is free to access. Um, and it is on, you just, you can just Google it. The, the actual name of the document is called the Voluntary Guideline on Veganism in Fashion. So uh, that in itself, the whole name, that's not something that we're going to discuss, but that's a really interesting, just the fact of how they called it, that was all, that's also really interesting to me, uh, but not particularly important for this session, just the fact that this is a, an available resource for you if you have an interest in having that information that's accessible online. Um, so all of these materials that I described and then a whole bunch of additional materials. So you might, uh, and chemicals. So um, squid ink has been used in fashion and textiles in the past. Um, obviously this is not harvested in the wild. And so there's, there's a lot of things um, that you might not suspect that are actually uh, taken uh, wholly or partly from animals. So um, basically I'm gonna talk a little bit about those materials um, and a little bit of, uh, I'm gonna do a, a bit of a debunking leather uh, portion of this, of this chat so that I feel like at least you'll um, leave with a little bit of additional information because I can talk about materials, but um, if there is not necessarily an understanding as to why, um, you know, there is a need for those materials to change, uh, then in a way I haven't really done my job appropriately. So first information that I kind of want to give is that um, leather can be made from a lot of things. So automatically we think you know leather can be made of cow um cows and bulls it can be made of uh the skin of lamb um and goats uh it can also be made from the skin of calves and even younger cows um sheep goats uh rabbits pigs kangaroos ostriches um snakes and alligators which is where we enter into the territory of all of those exotic skins um is what a lot of brands call them um but then you might not know also that cats and dogs skin has also been can also be made into leather so basically the process of making leather can be made with any animal skin um it's a process that's called tanning um, and the process basically takes the skin and changes the collagen structure in order for it not to break down. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, but basically, unless specified for any reason on a product, usually you wouldn't know what type of skin you are buying when you are buying a product. Um, what does that mean? That means that if you have a blanketly leather product, you might not know, usually you wouldn't know what animal you are wearing. So you could be wearing cow skin, you could be wearing sheep skin, but you could also be wearing pig skin or cat skin. Um, and I know that that could be confronting, but it's also because there's a lot of mislabeling that happens in the industry. Um, so because of that, there's also certifications um, that exist in the market. But all that to say that um, basically leather as a whole, um, unless the material is being treated for its actual um, visual properties, so like exotic skins, um, usually there's no real transparency as to which, um, basically what animal was processed into this material. Um, unless, as I said, for, for any specific reason. So um, because of this, it is important also to note that, and that is part of my debunking leather discussion, that um, leather is not always a byproduct of the meat industry, which is something that um, many people 
um, you know, put forward and that makes sense. It, it, our brains want it to be logical to say, well, you know, the animals are slaughtered for meat um, and therefore, you know, their skin is a byproduct. And so it makes sense for us to use it and make it into a material. So that logic, I mean, exists and is, is out there. And then there's this whole conversation that exists around, you know, do we use animals for human use? That's not really the point of this session. Ultimately, what I want to say here is that some of those materials that I was just discussing um, are not byproducts. The animals um, have been raised with the purpose of having their skin harvested. Um, and this is obviously, that's for parts of leather, of leather, but that is overwhelmingly for fur. For fur within the fur industry, the animals are 100% raised for their fur. And then usually the meat um, or anything that's not the fur is considered a byproduct. Um, so uh, the skins in the process of tanning, which I was discussing, basically the skins are preserved in two different ways. So you can preserve a skin with chromium. Um, so a chromium tanning process is basically very toxic. So um, you have to soak the skin continuously in order for it to um, uh, basically seep this chemical and basically stabilize it so that it doesn't decompose. I'm going to take a break because I saw that a question appeared. Um, so a question, are there vegan textile alternatives that aren't plastic or compostable or even biodegradable? I tend to think the manufacturing of plastic still impacts animals and including us. Excellent question. And I will definitely get back to it. This is a really great question. So Mary, stick around because there will be an answer to your question um, very soon. So. Um, but I'm just going to finish what I was discussing in regards to leather. So um, basically, yes. So uh, because we process, process the skins um, through this uh, chemical uh, stabilization, it removes this idea of being easy to biodegrade. So a lot of the discussion that's had with leather is usually around um, the fact that it is a natural product and that that makes it biodegradable. That in itself is actually not true to the same extent that, you know, my phone is not, you know, biodegradable. What I mean by that is that everything in some shape or form will degrade. But this idea that leather is biodegradable is actually false because even if you were to put a leather bag in a landfill, it will take hundreds of years to decompose. Because if you had the skin of an animal in your closet without going through that process, obviously that skin would decompose. But because it goes through that process, it makes it much less likely to biodegrade. So that conversation is really interesting when people discuss um, how leather is actually a more natural and biodegradable option. Due to that process, that's actually untrue. Um, so I have a little, I have a few interesting facts um, about leather as well, which I think are quite kind of topical. Um, and another thing has to do um, in regards to sustainability. Uh, another thing that I want to add before I talk about their stats is um, the skin of an animal compared to the materials that I'm going to discuss uh, in a moment, which are, you know, these big vegan alternatives, um, is that if you think about the logo, so usually I would have the logo. So if you think about the leather logo, um, I will like mime it. Uh, it's basically, you know, you might have seen it in a shoe or on a bag or on a label. And so it's basically this kind of shape with the hands, like, or the, I guess not the paws, but like the legs. And then you have the neck. And so basically the logo is actually quite representative of cow, cow skin, um, or sheepskin. So basically, um, if you think about that and actually building a product using this shape, it also means that there's actually quite a limit to the kind of product that you can do with uh, like a, this shape. So you'll have scars um, or bullet holes or scarring that's on the skin. So that also gives a lot of texture to the product. So when you're actually building 
um, uh, an animal-based product, um, you will usually have to work with either two different skins or you will have to like work the pattern with what you have. So there's actually, it, the, the whole skin is tanned um, and made into a stable material, but then there's actually quite a bit of waste. Um, and so basically this material, that skin has gone through this chemical process, which is, is quite an extensive chemical process. And then it's basically that waste, those off cuts that are not used in the making of a, of a product is just waste. So basically you've spent all of this chemical uh, and you've put all of this chemical that also ends up in waterways a lot. So there are ways to mitigate that, but a lot of it is actually non-mitigated and so basically straight into the waterways, um, usually in um, far removed countries where we don't see much of it here in Australia. Um, but basically, so that's one thing. So that's one of the advantages of working with a material that can actually be made on a roll, meaning you actually, there's actually less wastage um, when you use those types of stable, uh, stable materials that can be made on a roll. So we're gonna talk about that also in a second. Um, but I just wanna address basically one thing that I've also heard, which is part of my debunking leather portion is that um, if we think about the Amazon, so I don't know if you know this, but Bra Brazil is actually one of the world, I believe the world's second exporter of cow skins um, for the leather market. So um, if we think about Brazil, um, we can also think about deforestation because there's a lot of deforestation taking place in the Amazon. So looking at statistics 70 percent of the deforested land in the amazon is actually used for cattle ranching um and then of that additional 30 percent i believe it's 20 percent that is soybeans and i think 80 percent of that soy is actually to feed the animals so what and obviously these animals are mostly uh used for meat and then their skins are used for leather product but what i want to say is that independently of if it is the correct thing to do to use the animal and then use the skin the actual animal agriculture problem um is part of you know deforestation and environmental damage so just wanted to say this quickly so um Usually I will also, there is, you might have, that's the last thing I'm going to say about leather, you might have heard of vegetable tanned leather, which is another option, another way to tan um, leather. It doesn't have the same type of stability, so the color doesn't stay the same over time. The color of the leather might change slightly. Um, it, the actual texture might also be modified. Um, it also has the, the, the capacity to break down potentially quicker and without putting any toxins in the ground uh, or less toxins in the ground um, but it has to be in a very controlled environment so it's not actually that much better so um, if we think about what biodegrade biodegradability means um, according to the european union something that is bio readily biodegradable needs to usually biodegrade by 28 days. Um, and I was actually looking for this information in Australia here. And even, I think it's called the Council for Consum uh, Customer or Consumption, but they don't actually have an established definition for biodegradability. So basically I'm just setting the record straight that when you hear people say that leather is biodegradable, there's a lot to, more to this story um, than what they might think. think. Um, so there is, uh, there are like leather certifications. So there's the Leather Working Group, uh, which is an organization that works to certify um, leather products. Um, I believe that all of the leather in the world, of all of the, the basically billions of meter, of, of square footage of leather being done in the world, I believe that they've certified the origin of 15% um, of the, all of the leather being produced in the world. Um, so, uh, quick, so quick story for the other materials, because I talk a lot about leather replacements, so I kind of want to pass quickly on these other materials, despite the fact that they're also very important. So, 
Um, so we've spoken about leather. And so I mentioned leather, fur, silk, and wool. So in regards to fur, it's actually quite a similar process, meaning uh, the skin is being tanned, but with preserving the side um, that is usually that has the fur. Um, that process is very uh, intricate and detailed. You might have heard recently that um, Denmark is actually planning on culling its entire mink population. So that's 17 million uh, minks. Um, individual animals uh, because of a COVID mutation that has been found within their bloodstream. Um, but just to say that basically fur is still going on, fur is alive and well, despite the fact that it's been such a, uh, an important debate. And so many brands have actually come out in you know, support of banning fur. Um, and just yesterday, I, a town in the United States was the second town in the country to ban the sale of fur. But all that to say that fur is still very much um, alive and well. So um, I think, sorry, I, I hope you're not hearing this. I'm getting, I don't know why I'm getting um, updates. I hope that that didn't come through. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so just wanted to say, so there's leather and then for silk. So you might know this, so I'm going to kind of go quickly. Um, but silk um, as a material, is there is there someone writing a comment? Because I feel like it's okay. Hopefully, hopefully all good. Um, so basically, just quickly running through um, how you make silk. If you don't know, um, silk is basically a protein uh, that is made by a silkworm. So a silkworm usually will uh, transform into a moth. So basically in that process makes a cocoon around themselves. Um, and then uh, if they were to emerge into a moth, what they would do is they would eat through the actual cocoon um, and then basically go and live their lives. And then you would be able to harvest the cocoons and make them into silk. So that doesn't happen as much what really happens usually is that they actually harvest the cocoons with this the silkworm still inside of the of the cocoon and then they boil the cocoons so the idea here is yes so the cocoon basically is boiled with the silkworm inside of it so they are boiled alive um and basically the reason behind that is that silk is actually the longest continuous filament in the world um meaning that if you let the silkworm eat through the cocoon um that would break the filament whereas if you don't if you boil it um you basically get this continuous filament that has this beautiful sheen to it um and so that's why they usually don't let uh the moth or the the silkworm become a moth. Um, some producers do it very minimal. It is a, a minimal portion of the of the silk that's made. It's called a himza silk or pea silk. Um, and basically it doesn't have that same sheen and final texture uh, because ultimately uh, it has been broken. So they still they need to do process uh, a process um, called twisting where they bring basically the filaments together in order for um, for it to be made into um, a, a, a basically a filament. So basically that's the reason why silk is not vegan is because it is from an insect or an animal a living being um, and basically doesn't um, is not in accordance with the vegan philosophy. Um, and then finally, uh, just to quickly discuss wool, which is always such a polarizing subject, um, especially here because you have here in Australia such a strong history um, with wool. So there's a lot of things that are actually pretty unnatural in our relationship with wool and with animals. Um, some of them are, you know, the artificial insemination process that goes on. So this creation of animals in order to, to take their wool. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of discussions in the press over the years about, you know, some of the practices that take place in the industry. So the um, musing, the tail docking and uh, the castration of, uh, of male, uh, male lamb um, or male sheep. And then uh this discussion that basically um usually wool animals uh so sheep 
uh, will basically be used for their wool for about five or six years um, until their wool stops being as high quality. And then it basically, the industry calls it cast for age. Um, and then the animals are either sent to slaughter here or um, on live export ship. Um, so uh, sent overseas because their wool is actually older than the wool of lamb. Um, and so other countries call it mutton. Um, so that's one of the things that happen to uh, wool sheep that are basically used for their wool. Um, so that's the discussion about wool. So now that we've kind of covered these different elements of what is and isn't vegan, then we can talk about, um, you know, but what is being done? What exists? Why are there different uh, materials? So there's different reasons why there's different materials that are available now. So one of them is this kind of, um, not necessarily, the repulsion is probably not the right word, but this kind of change that's happening um, in the mentalities over the materials that we use, over our relationship with animals and over the actual environmental impact that comes from uh, using animals. So um, I will talk to you now about a whole bunch of different materials that exist. So before we do that, though, because I still have Mary's question in mind, um, were there any questions that were specific to, um, to leather or wool or silk or fur or anything like that? I'm just going to drink a water sip. And if you have a question, I'll let you type it out. Otherwise, I'll just kind of continue because it's already 7.05 and I want to leave time for questions. Okay. Well, I don't see any questions, so that's pretty good. Um, so what I'm going to do is basically show you some interesting materials. So um, if we talk about, but before I do that, I'm just going to quickly talk about, you know, sustainability and fashion. So we've gone through um, this discussion about, you know, uh, we are replacing, you know, leather as a material, or we are replacing a filament, so uh, or uh, a fiber to make a textile. Um, so there's a lot. I will not necessarily show you. There's an actually really really interesting uh, fibers and textiles wheel that basically shows you all of the different materials that exist and the different ways that we can use materials to make fashion and textiles. Um, but it's usually it's it's just really visual, so I can't really show it to you now. But so we'll straight away talk about leather replacements and textile innovation. So the first leather replacement uh, that came out, um, and that basically was an imitation of leather, is polyvinyl chloride. So polyvinyl chloride is basically a coated fabric that combines um, a textile, so a textile backing. Um, it can be a um, like a cotton woven, um, or uh, it could even be a polyester woven, and then that's covered with a polymer film. So basically, uh, but you can also put it on the knit. Uh, but basically, what it does is that material that's at the back gives the material strength. Um, and then uh, basically it's like a liquid. So yes, polyvinyl chloride is uh, derived from um, the petrochemical industry. Um, you will see it on a label as PVC. So if you ever see something that's PVC coated or made of PVC, it stands for polyvinyl chloride, and basically polyvinyl chloride is the name of the chemical that is being put on top of that um, of that backing, that textile backing. Um, so basically, it the idea here is that it protects. Like, there's a lot of um, of of surfacing that's done in the fashion and textiles industry. So basically, this one is like a synthetic. Uh, uh, liquid that's being put on top of this backing and basically it gives you the same finish as let's say a faux leather jacket um, and PVC has is part of that family of materials that have now been um, re-labeled as vegan leather. Um, so that's the first one. Um, I thought that I had something made of PVC. I only have things that are made of the all of the other materials 
to the next thing that I'm going to talk to you about. So PVC looks a lot like the next material I'm going to talk to you about. And there's a lot of conversation in the vegan community and in the non-vegan community about, you know, well, you have leather, but then you have those plastic um, or there's petrochemical uh, materials that are in the industry. So what do we do? So, but before I'll just show you the other one. So the other material is called polyurethane. So uh, polyurethane is a similar process, less uh, damaging to the environment. Um, so it is usually also a coated, um, coated material with a uh, woven uh, or a knit, but usually a woven backing. So um, it can be used to make things like this wallet um, or I have here a beautiful bag from a local brand called Sound Beast, and they use a really high quality polyurethane. So um, you can see it on their label that it says um, designed in Melbourne, um, and it is a polyure eco polyurethane outer um, and then a polyester lining. So basically, um, this is so I don't know if you can see it well but basically it does have it's quite heavy um it has a beautiful quality to it but um it is one of those leather replacements that you know is up to you in regards to how you feel about those types of materials um it, it depends on it, it's it's you know nowadays it's actually quite difficult to make a decision and to choose a product um because there you know there is so there's pros and cons to a lot of materials so we're going to continue to discuss that um, so uh, basically polyurethane is like a resin that's being uh, placed onto a backing again. Um, there is such a thing as PU leather where uh, basically some of the, the material, the polyurethane is ultimately placed on top of um, or backed with a portion of leather that's called PU leather. Um, but usually it will be labeled as such. So if it just says polyurethane, it doesn't have any leather into it. Um, now let's talk about really fun material innovation. So of all of the different materials that are used to, uh, to replace leather, the first one I'm going to talk about is cork. So I'm going to show it to you. So I'm going to do a bit of a show and tell. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is cork. So cork, which comes from the uh, cork tree um, in, uh, it's a cork oak tree. Um, a lot of it comes from Portugal. Um, so uh, basically, I usually would show you photos of things that have been made out of cork, but we have, you know, wallets. Um, they've also made basically what they do. So the way that it's harvested is that they take it, you could actually poke a hole in it to make like a wine, um, like a wine stuffer. But basically what they do is that they cut it in this really, really thin sheet. This one is not even thin enough for basically to, if they were to make something that's really flexible with it, but they cut it really thinly and then they treat it and they coat it. Um, and you can actually buy a uh, cork, um, uh, cork bags or uh, cork, cork wallets and as I was saying I saw um, a sofa once like a couch uh, that was covered in cork fabric so um, what's really interesting about cork is that um, basically they reharvest the trees every um, 20 years and so basically the trees are not cut down they just re regrow their cork and then they reharvest it um, so uh, it's basically boiled in the factory, which makes the cork cells expand and then they can treat it in order to stabilize it and kind of give it a really nice um, finish for it not to rot because it is also, you know, a material that lives in nature. So to the same as something else like we were discussing, it would biodegrade just by itself. So it does need to be treated um, in order for it to be stable and to not just biodegrade. So that's for cork. Um, the next material that I'm going to talk about is called Pinatex. So I'm sure you've heard of it if you have any kind of interest um, into um, uh, you know, materials and, and leather replacement. Uh, Mary Cork was one of those conversations uh, or one of those materials that re respond to your question. But basically Pinatex that I'm showing to you now. So Pinatex 
is made out of pineapple. Um, so the head of pineapples, um, basically they harvest, uh, they harvest the byproduct of the pineapple industry um, and then they crush it and then they make it into a material. So it does have to be coated um, the coating itself um, makes it not completely biodegradable, but the backing, most of the material actually is biodegradable because it is from nature. So um, here in Melbourne, a few businesses actually uh, use Pinatex. So um, one of them is called Kinds of Grace. Um, she, uh, the designer is local to uh, Melbourne and uses some Pinotex in her bags. And then another brand that uses Pinotex that is also local is called Ahimsa Collective. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about Ahimsa Collective a bit later because they're using a new material in their recent collection, uh, which is a material that just dropped last year that is like a game changer for, um, for the world, really. Um, and so... Basically, Pinatex, I don't know if you can see, but it has a really, um, it doesn't have the texture of leather. It has a very, um, very specific look to it. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily think it is leather, but it has a really fun and interesting finish. It's quite malleable. Um, it's quite subtle, but it is, I would say it's got good durability as well. So that's one material. So the next material that I'm going to talk about, which is the one I was just discussing, which is so exciting, um, is called Desertor. So Desertor is made out of cactus. So uh, basically it kind of came out last year. So it's straight out of Mexico. Um, and basically the inventor, so it's a similar feel where you have a backing and then you have a coating. Uh, but basically that backing um, is also certified for them. So I believe it's organic cotton. And then um, the, the actual liquid that is being put on top, um, that material is uh, made out of powdered uh, cactus. So here, uh, I don't remember what the name of that exact cactus, but basically it makes a fruit. Um, so I had the name and the name now escapes me, which is super unfortunate, but, um, basically it is, uh, made out of the, of the cactus and so the leaves, so they just harvest the leaves, let the leaves to dry and then crush it and make it into a kind of powder like that they, and then in a resin and then coat it on top. So, um, if my memory is correct, 80% of the searcher is actually um, biodegradable because it is from the pineapple industry. Uh, not pineapple, cactus industry, sorry. Um, so they are USDA organic. So the farms are organic. They require almost no water. Um, so it's really, and it's got the most beautiful texture. And so that brand I was just telling you about, Himsa Collective, they have just launched a collection with the searcher. So it's absolutely, a, it's a gorgeous material. I wish I could let you touch it and like give it to you through the screen. Um, it has really uh, the most beautiful finish. It's subtle. Um, it's got a little bit of stretch because it is built on a knit. Um, but it's anyway, it's a beautiful, beautiful material. And it is absolutely the most incredible innovation. Um, and they won uh, prizes from LVMH, uh, which is a luxury conglomerate, so Louis Vuitton, uh, Moet, NSC. Um, and all of those major businesses, all of those major conglomerates are all running these incredible um, kind of innovation awards uh, on a yearly basis to try and find these new materials and encourage innovation because it is so needed due to the environmental impact of fashion in general, and then the materials that we use. Um, so, you know, what I'm showing you to what I'm showing to you today could be completely different in a year or two, because someone will come up with, you know, a new, exciting, interesting materials. Um, there's another one that I'm going to show you right now, um, called fruit leather. So this one, if I could, I, it, it smells incredible. So this one is made out of mango. It's made in the Netherlands. So it's kind of interesting that they make um, a leather replacement in the leather Netherlands out of mango because that's not necessarily, you know, what you associate straight away with the Netherlands. But basically this material 
is um, it's, it, it feels like a very strong, I'd say, leather. So if you were to have like a very hardy leather, it's not as flexible. It's got a very, very um, like strong texture. It smells incredible like a fruit roll up. Um, and basically I bought some samples in a variety of colors, but ba it's, it's a beautiful material um, that feels very durable if you were to make like shoes with it, or if you were to make something that's quite, um, yeah, that would kind of get through the test of time. So that's another material that is out there uh, for us to discuss. Um, there are materials that are being made with mushrooms uh, that you might have heard about. So uh, basically growing uh, mushrooms in a lab and then uh, using the material, tanning the material and making it into um, a leather replacement. I have a ton of videos that usually show the process, um, and, but basically uh, it is being discussed also with the searcher as probably one of the um, the most strong leather replacements that exist out there that might be the future because it is fully biodegradable and they can give it a texture. Um, uh, H&M has done a collection, a conscious collection last year and they used a, um, a material called Vijaya. Um, and Vijaya is ultimately a, a leather replacement that uses a grape byproduct. So um, food waste, and leather replacements are very much aligned at the moment. So everything that has to do with uh, agricultural waste is very much being used by the fashion industry and rethought in order to make innovative materials. Um, so there's a lot of um, additional materials. So uh, in regards to um, to uh, uh, fibers and textiles uh, that are being made in order to um, replace, you know, silk. Um, there is lyocell. So, uh, so I don't, I, I could show you, uh, but it, you wouldn't know what's the difference. It looks the same. Um, so basically, lyocell is made out of wood pulp that's been broken down and made into a filament. Um, so viscose is a similar process. They're called man-made uh, cellulose fibers. Um, but basically, a viscose is actually quite environmentally damaging because they don't uh, reclaim the chemicals. But a lyocell, they can do a closed-loop system. Um, so they recapture the chemicals, and uh, they can kind of continuously reuse them. Um, and uh, a lyocell can be made out of bamboo. Um, Tencel, which you might hear of. Um, Tencel is also a lyocell process. Tencel is usually made of eucalyptus tree. Um, and then there's other ones like Refibra. I believe that one is made out of, no, Modal, sorry, Modal, that's made out of birch tree. Um, so there's all of these different uh, wood pulps that are being used uh, in order to make new materials as well. Um, there's a company in Italy uh, called Orange Fiber. Uh, and they decided to work with the byproduct of the orange juice industry. Um, and they basically use that white lining in between the orange and the skin. So that white lining that you might remember, you know, you pull it off. Um, they basically break that down and then they make that into a textile um, a filament. So basically, um, there is just an incredible amount of textile innovation that happens in the space of fashion and textiles. Um, I realize that I've been speaking nonstop for 50 minutes. Um, I'm just going to say that in addition to all of these materials, the growth of vegan fashion and textiles has also meant that there's a lot of labels um, that are happening uh, that are available out there that you can um, basically use uh, in order to basically find products that are registered with those um, societies. I have to say uh, that the process is not rigorous, meaning that there is no auditing really that goes on. Um, and that could be problematic uh, at some point, especially with the explosion um, of, you know, of vegan fashion and textiles. And then the last thing that I'm going to say also really quickly is that um, Mimco here locally in Australia um, came up recently or, or uh, uh, launched a collection that is made with um, apple byproduct. So um, basically, there's all of these products that are being made with fruits, um, with uh, um, 
agricultural waste. And so uh, if that is, you know, it's it's an incredible world. There's just so many innovative materials. Um, hopefully you feel like you've learned a little bit from this session. There was a lot of ground to cover. Um, and if you have any anything that you want to clarify, any videos that you want me to send you, happy to send you that. But otherwise, I'm just going to come back and check if there's questions. So, um, okay. So do the plant leather with, okay, so there's a few questions. Fantastic. So the first question is, uh, do the plant leathers come with waterproofing? So um, it depends. So it depends on how they're coated. Um, I believe that they would be. Um, the thing is the actual PUs and the PVCs I know are waterproof. Um, for those materials, I think that they have to tr trial the test of time. Um, obviously when they're coated, like for example, the cork, I guess it's a question of not leaving them in the rain to get drenched. Uh, but I believe that they would be able to sustain some water. Um, however, to what extent, that is an excellent question that I, um, I wouldn't have an answer to. Then uh, using the food waste byproduct is great to hear. Yeah, it's incredible the amount of innovation that's happening. Like if I had more time, I could talk about the fact that like they're using corn, finally reuse it. They stopped. They're now using corn again uh, to make filament. Uh, to make f uh, fibers and textiles. So that's super exciting. They're using all of these um, existing materials. Obviously, I could talk also about like hemp and cotton and all of that. I just feel like they're not particularly innovative. So it's, you know, a little bit, not that it's not useful. I just feel like I, the goal is more to talk about new things and new exciting things that are happening. But yeah, um, so much is happening in the food waste space. Um, and then Stephanie, you write, maybe I missed this, but the fabric is made from tree pulp. Is it using byproduct or yes, yeah, so, um, new trees are cut down. However, they are from sustainable, uh, sustainably managed forest. So for example, for tensile specifically, um, the actual fiber comes from a company called lensing, um, and lensing uses only sustainable forestry, like not like, um, accredited forests. So those forests were grown specifically for that purpose to the same extent of you know there's just it's part of agriculture ultimately so you know which it so it is but they're not they don't do like old growth forests to um, make the fibers i don't know if that you know is helpful uh but basically and then uh it, when they use bamboo to make bio cell that's actually one of the most eco-friendly that you can do if it's not bamboo rayon if it's just bamboo lyo cell uh because bamboo grows so fast um so in that sense that's probably a match made in heaven here in melbourne there's a, a bedding company uh called etitude um and they um they use uh, bamboo lyocell. So that's a bit exciting. There's a lot of, the, the interesting thing is that some of these materials are not like completely removed and, and unaccessible. A lot of these brands are actually quite um, willing to make uh, the materials accessible to people. And I think that that's really, really fantastic. Um, are there any other questions? So uh, thanks, all great info. Thank you for being here, Anne-Marie. Uh, so happy that you could come today. Um, then Mary, just wondering if the cost of producing plant-based textile is more expensive to manufacture. Um, so in regards to just concern about accessibility to general population, um, as I said, uh, probably in regards to the, the process, like creating new materials in itself, I feel like a lot of it is powered by those um, uh, businesses uh, or those organizations are usually those university research projects that become just really cool interesting innovations um, so but in regards to like buying the actual material they're not that unaccessible um, I had a lecture from Tessa recently in one of my classes where she said that it's actually uh, sorry Tessa's from Ahimsa Collective um, and she said that the price of, of leather and of pineapple leather versus cactus leather is all, like they, they're pretty much the same price in terms of using it um, to make product. Um, if you're talking about just making the actual material, the other thing is most of those are actually in a, so innovative that they're patented. So that might just be a, one of the hurdles uh, that kind of happened. But 
there's just so much innovation that's happening in this space um, uh, that I feel like we're just kind of, it's going to continue to be more and more accessible. Um, then Sam asks, have you found any new textiles presenting as eco-friendly, which are not vegan? Ooh, that's very interesting. Um, not really. Um, I feel like PVC and PU probably are some of those in terms of, you know, they're not necessarily innovative, but they have rebranded as vegan. Um, there are uh, a lot of just, you know, materials that probably were accidentally vegan that are remaining vegan. Uh, those polyesters that people are just like will slap a vegan label on anything but i feel like that's part of the of the vegan debate in itself meaning um that you know brands will just kind of surf on that wave and try and capitalize on it um so i feel that that's kind of more what happens here um so okay i thought that maybe i, I for a second i thought that there was like a ton of questions i was like i will have to like bang 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 get all of those questions out um if there's no other questions i kind of don't want to keep you all this session with 6 30 to 7 30. um i just want to make sure that basically i'm i've answered everyone's questions but as i said um i will write my staff email um in the comments so if you want to send me an email um you can um basically i'm yeah as i said i'm a phd but i'm also i i'm i'm doing my phd but i'm also a lecturer at rmit so um if you have any questions you can feel free um to send me an email there um and then stephanie you write in your opinion what product do you feel is the most value as far as longevity honestly um i really think that this these new materials so i haven't actually touched the one that's made out of mushroom but from what they talk about in regards to um, in regards to its impact and the potential for the biodegradability of that material, I'm going to be really excited to see it and to see what they can do with it. But currently, current state, I think that this new material, um, if you're willing to take a risk on it, um, the, the cactus leather, the one that's made out of cactus, because it is a native uh, plant that grows in in Mexico, so it they, and they don't need to do anything to it. So it they don't need to water it. It just like it's it's basically it's self sustaining. Um, they don't have to replant because they just harvest the leaves, which continue to grow back. The actual process is pretty much closed loop. Um, they are so keen on getting all the certifications. The actual I feel like it's a business of understanding who the founders are when the founders are environmentally friendly in themselves and the idea behind the innovation is to basically fix a problem like these guys uh this sector um are doing so that's spelled d-e-s-s-e-r-t-o um they are all about that environmental friendliness um so in that sense i feel like i'm um it's a lot of brands are getting behind it. I don't know if you know Gallery Lafayette in Paris. Um, they just did a collection with them. Um, they are basically, oh, they are be they are going to explode. So many brands want to work with them. Um, we are so lucky that um a local brand has basically was able to kind of you know get across and and snatch a little bit of product. Um, but yeah, I think that in regards to the environmental, in, in regards to how it looks and in regards to basically how much it passes as leather, because the quality and the look of it is exactly what you would expect. Just because of that, in regards to longevity, I believe that that product is probably the, the one that's going to go ahead the most because it kind of ticks all of those boxes that you could want um, in regards to, whereas something like a Pinatex, um is in itself it looks it doesn't look like leather and people still expect for stuff to look like leather um so i guess that that's I, by answering this question i feel like i want to take into consideration all of those elements and not just say you know this one is the most environmentally friendly because like cork would probably be the most environmentally friendly um but ultimately would it last potentially not but I honestly really think that this series of like byproducts from agriculture and from plants is probably one of the best ways forward, really. 
um, for, for the fashion industry in general. Um, so if there's no other questions, I'm really, so this is like, I, I try to, I, I love to show stuff usually because then you're not just sitting in front of your computer or just listening to me blab for an hour. Um, hopefully you still found it interesting and you feel like you learned a lot of stuff. Uh, I really am hopeful that I was able to say basically like give you a lot of interesting information and um, yeah, please get in touch if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, I'm on Instagram at Rachel Lamarsh. Um, and yeah, otherwise, um, let me see. Um, yeah, so thank you for, thank you Moreland City Libraries for having me. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for everyone who showed up today. I hope you had a really good time. Um, and it's been my pleasure to talk to you this evening and hopefully I get to talk to you again. Uh, have a great evening. Take care. You made it through lockdown and yay. Amazing. Congratulations to you for just making it through 2020. Um, it's been a pleasure and have a great evening, everyone.